you for taking the time to be with us at C3. We hope you enjoy today's message. And go for the rest of us, if you would open your Bibles to the book of Hebrews. We are in chapter 11. For all those online, for our friends up in Buffalo that are listening, we are glad that you are with us. For those that are out in the overflow area in the cafe, we are in, as I said, Hebrews 11. A couple things before we begin. As you saw, Light the Night is coming up on uh, Halloween on October 31st. Uh, beginning next week or throughout this week, um, we will have the... Uh, the tub's out to receive candy, so if you want to bring some candy in, it's a great opportunity for us to be in the community uh, and to let people know on a, a night that celebrates darkness that there is light, and we get an opportunity to just to, to be a presence and to just touch people in, in their life, because after all, how many people know people out in our world need Jesus? And that's one of the reasons that we do... Um, Light the night, it's the reason we do early everything, is that, that so that people have an opportunity to know the very love of, of Jesus Christ. Let me ask you this as we begin. Anybody here ever been to some of the bigger museums, the halls of fame and sports, any of that, and you got a chance to read about like people that were famous? Anybody find that really intriguing? I love to read the, the story about people that have done some really cool things in their life or to go to spots where, uh, where people lived and then to read their, their little short bio. When I go to, uh, to, to Cleveland to an Indians game, I like to work my way out into center field and just read the, the, the parts about some of the famous players. We don't have as many as maybe other pro, uh, other pro teams, but you know, just guys that did some amazing things. Well, the author this morning is going to be doing that for us as well. Comes to the point in, in Hebrews where he's now talking about the, the hall of fame of people that have lived. It's kind of a hall of faith. And he's going to begin to explain uh, some aspects about faith using their life as an illustration to a group of people that we know have really been struggling. So if you are new this morning to C3, we're going to try to catch you up really, really quick. Um, and, and we'll start this by kind of letting, letting you know uh, what we were talking about last week. And so we said last week that we were defining faith, and we said faith it has to be something. It's something that, that the author has been talking about it. Up to chapter 11, do you know that the author has used the word faith 68 times before he even gets to the chapter where it's almost like a nonstop thing? And so it's like he steps back and goes, well, you know what? We've been talking about faith. I better actually give you a definition. And so in chapter 11, verse 1, he says, here's what faith is. It's confidence in what we hope for. And we said last week, it's kind of like this oxymoron. A confident hope is, is something that you would not normally put together. You know, we are confident about the future, even though we can't see it because it's not there yet. So we talked about God has this ability being omnipresent where he is at and in all time at the same time. So the future, the present, all time that has existed, he is there, which makes him omnipresent by, by definition. And so for him, he is able to be in the future and then to send back uh, words, and in the Old Testament, it was done through a, what was called a prophet. He was able to say, now this is what this looks like. This is what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen 100 years from now. This is going to happen 1,000 years from now. And the prophecy was talking so much about one who was going to come, known as the Messiah. And he was going to come, and he was going to rescue the very people of God. He was going to save. He was going to restore. He was going to renew. Not only that, but, but he is, in fact, the king of all. And the king is coming, and he is going to overrule all of the kingdoms, and he's going to establish, ultimately, his kingdom. And his kingdom is going to be perfect. And, and, and so the, the author is talking to people who were living in a kingdom that was uh, ruled by the Romans, at this particular time frame, 
And their kingdom was not perfect. It was very oppressive. It was very difficult. Um, they were persecuted for their faith. They were ridiculed for their faith. They were excluded because of their faith. They did not fit in the world. They did not fit in, the, uh, in their former walk of, of faith. They didn't fit in the, the system, the religion of Judaism anymore. Jesus had changed all of that, but all of a sudden they're discovering that this isn't all great. And so he's writing saying, look, there is one that's going to change all of this. And if you're thinking about leaving that, don't. Because the theme of his letter to the Jewish believers is that Jesus Christ is so far superior. He's so much better than anything. He's better than the angels. So the angels who would periodically show up and do some amazing things, he goes, he's so far better than them. He's he speaks better and knows the future better than the prophets because he's the one that would inform them. He's better than any kind of king that Israel would ever have or any ruler in this world, no matter how good, how noble, how philanthropic that king may be. He is so far better, and, and he has the ability to change the whole time, the whole epic, everything. He is so far beyond all of this. He's better than any sacrifice or sacrificial system. And they would get that to go, you know, we, would, we don't have to keep going to the temple and offering sacrifices for our sins. He says, look, there was one Jesus who comes and gives his life once for all. There's no more. There's no more need for this. As the high priest, he's better than in the priestly order. We don't need that anymore. We don't need to go to somebody who, gets to, who stands between God and us he does that. He puts a hand on God. He puts a hand on us. And we are brought together in the family of God by him. So he's better than the priesthood. He's better than religion. Everything now drives itself to him. So don't think about going back to something because the, the old is obsolete. The old is no longer relevant. The old no longer fits because the new has come, which is what we celebrated this morning. And so faith then is that evidence of what you can't see. So faith is the way that we navigate that. Without faith, none of this makes sense. The only thing that seems to make sense is how the world, world operates. And so he's encouraging them to use their sense, not just their physical sense of being able to see or being able to hear, or being able to smell, being able to taste, being able to touch. He says, there is a sense that helps us to understand and to navigate the next kingdom, the eternal kingdom, the place where God lives, and it's faith. And it's only by faith that that happens. So what is unseen can only be realized through faith. It's the only way it makes sense. So without faith, then you can't walk in a way that pleases God. You don't have a standing that is righteous or you don't understand what right standing is all about. So faith kind of envelops all of it and our faith helps us to navigate all of that, he would say. So this morning we're going to pick up and he's going to say, now in light of that, let's give you some illustration. So he's going to play tour guide to the, the Jewish believers and to all who would read this and say, so let me take you through a hall of fame of those who had great faith. Now, if you notice, in any place you go, a museum or in the, any of the hall of fames for whether it's college, whether it's professional sports, they never tell you all the bad things that happen in this person's life. And neither will he hear. Because what he's saying is it's in their faith that they have become this. And he's going to take us and say, now, you're right here, and if you want to get to here, this is where your faith is going to take you. And this morning, we're going to look at really three of these, and over the next three weeks, we're going to try to work our way through all of these so that we get a complete, um, extreme example of the evidence of faith and how it works, but not only how it works, how it works for you here in the 21st century, living here in Erie County somewhere, wherever you live, and then what you take with it and 
what it, it means for daily living. And the Bible has a lot to say about this, more so than maybe what we think. And for some, this may be somewhat challenging. Uh, and for others, it's just going to be a, a confirmation. So wherever you sit, um, let's kind of strap it on and dive in and, and, and dig a little bit at what he says. We left off last week in, in verses 1 and 2, and we're going to kind of pick up. He says in verse 1, he says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance of what we don't see. This is what the ancients were commended for. So all these people, this is what they were commended for. They did this. So the, the, the people that he's going to be talking from the beginning of creation to where they are in that particular day, he said they were commended because they had confident hope. They were sure of God's future. They didn't, wa- they didn't vacillate at all. They were able to settle this and have this hope in a future, that there was one that was going to come that was going to rescue them. There was one that was going to come that was going to be a king. There was this king that was going to establish the the whole kingdom. And that's the story of the Bible, guys. The story of the Bible can only be understood through a king and his kingdom. It can't be understood by a verse, a chapter, or a book. You have to take every single book, all 66, and funnel them through the narrative of a king and his kingdom. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. Or it, what it does to us is it kind of pigeonholes us and creates kind of a, a foot in cement kind of a faith. That we only believe it, but we only believe it through these kind of lenses in the way it was taught us. So he's trying to get them to see the narrative. Now, there's always been a king, and this king was in a faraway place, and this king was going to establish a kingdom. And he was going to be doing that in spite of the fact that the subjects, that the subjects themselves rejected, that they, uh, they fought against the king, and as a result, they were put into a place. They were put into this, this place of almost an imprisonment. But yet the king wasn't looking to, to keep them in prison. The king was going to come and rescue them. And there was a foreign par- power that came and overthrew them. And... Uh, subjected them to slavery and you can find that all the way all the way through so he takes them on a journey and he continues to deliver them he continues to rescue them until one day he himself will become one of them and he will rescue and then he will begin building this kingdom that one day those who are loyal subjects will discover you know what there's a great reward for all this and what that looks like and how it means and he's trying to get them to to get out of just this this every day, what I see by my senses, and I don't feel that there is any reward to this, and it's just too hard. I'd rather go back to the other way. That's what he's looking at. That's what verse 1 we said last week he was talking about. Verse 3, he says, now by faith we understand. Okay, underline that. Circle that. Understand. Now, one of the reasons, by the way, that I, I constantly encourage you to bring a Bible is that you can highlight, you can underline, you can circle, you can make notes. Because here's the deal. There's going to be a point in your life, at some point, where your faith is going to get tested or you're going to struggle in your faith. It's important for you guys to have notes when we walk through this because you don't get an opportunity. I'm not going to take your call probably at 10 o'clock at night and go, hey, Pastor Greg, by the way, you know, I'm really struggling here. And like seven months ago, you were in that series on Hebrews that seemed to take forever. And you were talking about something in faith. And, and you said something on that one. I got news for you. I'm probably not going to take your call at 10 o'clock at night. And secondly, I'm probably not going to remember. So that's why we have a Bible. That's why you write the Bible for us at C3 is our textbook. It's what we study. It's, it's what, we, what we use so that when you hit something, a bump in your road, maybe a habit, maybe a relationship, maybe something at work, it becomes something that you can go, aha, I can look back at that and I can walk back through that and I can relearn, re-encourage myself to go forward. So understanding becomes really, really important because all of this is what flows out of understanding. Understanding isn't by memorizing something or just knowing what something says. It is the ability to take that and make it real for you in your present circumstance, in your present life. So he says, by faith, 
we understand. So without faith, there's no understanding. So you, there's, there's a faith aspect to this to navigate that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. And so what he says then is, is just looking at this, he goes, okay, let me give you an example here, the way the world was created. Now, you have to have faith to understand this, and just like the, the aspect of science, there is a faith to understand how they view this. So both science and the Bible, kingdom of God, operate off of this faith when it comes to how this world was created. Now, science is now catching up to the Bible, by the way. And science says all of this was started, what? With a Big Bang, right? So there was this cosmic explosion of all various gases saying that something gas created something. Because you can't have something being created out of nothing, can you? That's impossible. You need something to create something. Anybody that's ever made anything had to have something to create something. You don't just stand there and I go, I have nothing, so I'm going to build this. And that's, what, that's been the stumbling block for science. They're like, they, they can only be something. So this something had to be this. And all of this did this. And it created this massive explosion. And then here's what we have. We have something. He says, okay... In the beginning, the Bible is going to explain how this was, and it's by faith that we believe it. Page one of Genesis, right? In the beginning, God said, let there be light. So you need faith to believe that what? That the voice of God exploded nothingness into somethingness. They're going, okay, there has to be an explanation for nothing becoming something, over here, there has to be an explanation for nothing becoming something or creation being created out of where there was no creation or what is visible being created from what is invisible. So here we have a what? We have a uncreated creator creating. Over here in the world side, we have creation being created out of all this something of gases and explosiveness and the, the way that they came and it was created over there. Science now has come to the place where they are believing that this had to have an intelligent design behind it. That something created out of that of something had to have a designer. So you have to have faith in intelligent design, whatever that is. The Bible explains that over here. So the only way that we grasp page one is by faith. So the whole story of the Bible starts, continues, is lived, is finalized by faith, is what he's saying. And that's what the ancients were commended for. Was their, was their faith complete? No, it wasn't. It wasn't incomplete. Because what did we say last week? They all believed the world was flat. It wasn't round. They believed the world was propped up on pillars as a flatness. And that God was the one who, who put them there and periodically shakes them to get people's attention. So that begins to grow in, in understanding. But by faith, they knew that there was a God that created all of this and, and how it was formed. And it, it was all formed out of what is invisible. Now, he goes, all right, now let me, let me show you some. So, so now that we have this established, come on with me down this hall. And we're going to take a stop and we're going to see our first guy. And I'm going to tell you a little story about this guy. And his name is Abel. And he says, by faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks even though he is dead. So Abel becomes our first guy. And it kind of helps us to understand something about faith. What he's saying here about Abel is that faith is demonstrated. It has to be demonstrated. There has to be something that we do or it's totally useless. 
Or in other words, maybe it's totally dead, which right away should kind of propel us to some other guy. And I want you to see what he says. I want you to turn one book in your Bible to the right, going towards the back, and it's the book of James. You can either turn there or you can trust me while I read it. Either way, you're going to have to have faith that I'm right. So in, in chapter 2, James is talking about this difference that faith has to be this demonstration, that it's doing something. Otherwise, it, it really is kind of meaningless. And so look what he says, beginning in verse 14 of chapter 2. He says, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds or, or works, depending on your translation? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, okay, faith by itself, kind of put that in parentheses, if it's not accompanied by action, it's dead. It's dead. And so the writer of Hebrews is, is, is playing off of this with this guy, Abel, that we'll, just, we'll talk about here in a minute. He says, so let me just take you a little bit further. He says, show me your faith without deeds or without works, and I'll show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God good. Okay, so what he's saying is, now, if you, if you take faith by itself, okay, and you say, I believe that there is just one God. He's the creator of the heavens and earth. How many people believe that? Okay, we believe that. That he sent his son Jesus to die for our sins. How many people believe that? And it's the only way, okay? And that Jesus died on the cross, that he was buried, that he died on the third day. How many people believe that? Okay? That he rose again, ascended into heaven, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. How many people believe that? Okay? Watch what he says about that. Even the demons believe that. And they shudder. Why do they shudder? Because they know who Jesus is. Does that mean they have faith and they're saved? No. It just means that they have a belief. They know exactly. They believe the same thing. So the question here then becomes not that the faith doesn't stand alone because we're saved by faith. Faith is a standalone, but, and I want you to write this down, we are never to stand alone in our faith. Faith stands alone, but we are not to stand alone in our faith. Faith, by nature, causes us to do something. So he starts back and says, let's go all the way back. So let's go all the way back. Go back in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 4. Shortly after the fall, way back in the beginning of time, things were perfect. Man had sinned. There was an Adam, there was an Eve. Adam and Eve really cared about each other, really loved each other. However, Adam and Eve made a mistake. They chose to do something their way rather than God's way, and they were excluded from God's kingdom, and the story begins. However, Adam and Eve still had a life, and Adam and Eve loved each other, chapter 4 says, and Adam was with his wife, and she became pregnant. You, I don't, we have to draw any pictures. We all are adults here. We understand how that works. And she gave birth to Cain, firstborn. Firstborn son usually is always good, sometimes not so much. Jesus will tell a parable about a firstborn son. doesn't always go well. And she said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man, which from man comes man. Cain means, you know, with God's help. So later after that, she gives birth to another son, and his name is Abel. Now, Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. So one's a shepherd, one's a farmer. In the course of time, Cain brought forth some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. Now, that's pretty cool. He's leading the way, right, for the family. He goes, you know, somehow, some way, Cain figures out, you know what? There's something wrong in the way all this works. And I know God. I walk with God. I've talked with God. Something in me is drawing me to say I, I need to bring an offering to God. So I've got to figure out how that is. So he does. And then Abel also goes, you know what? 
I realize that I don't measure up and I come from, I come from uh, sin and, and I, I've participated in sin in my life and I walk with God, I know God, so I should bring an offering. And here's where the story turns. So Abel brings an offering in verse 6 and he brings some of the best from some of the firstborn. So he brings the best and the first. It sounds like our offering, doesn't it? He brings the best and the first from his flock. Now, it's going to take faith to do that because at this point in time, he doesn't have a whole lot. So we're not even sure whether all he has is one. Maybe he has two. Okay? So he's got to do what? He's got to use faith to trust God that something in this offering is going to bring him into this place that we would call righteousness or a right way of, of saying he's in right standing with God in the context of that time. So the Lord then looks with favor. He likes what Abel does and his offering. But on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was angry. Actually, he was very angry, and his face became downcast. So it's a way of going, you know what? What's Cain doing? Anybody that's had a four-year-old, Cain's pouting, right? You, know, you like him better. I, I, I knew it all along. You like the little kid better. So what is he? He's better looking. He's more talented. Whatever. I don't know why you like him. I, you know what? This, is, this stinks. I did the same exact thing. I brought stuff. So he's kind of pouting with this whole thing. And what we find then is not only is faith supposed to be in a, a demonstration, but faith has to be in motion, doesn't it? There has to be an action to it. So now both of these guys have an action that is going one is of faith, but look at the difference in all of this. The, the fact that uh, uh, faith that is an action, it's based though, on the decisions that we make because he's going to start with Cain and Abel. Abel does something out of a decision, as does Cain. If you're here last week, we talked about left-hand kingdom, right-hand kingdom. Abel makes a right-hand kingdom choice. That probably is going to bring delayed gratification is solely based on faith. Cain makes a left-hand decision based on what is natural of man or what is intuitive of man. I'm not giving you my best. So what Cain says is, you know what? Yes, worshiping God is in fact a good thing to do. Abel says, yes, worshiping God is probably a good thing to do. Where they change is this. Cain says, I'm going to choose how I decide to worship God. It's going to be my way. Abel says, I'm going to decide how I worship God his way. And so when God then shows pleasure, saying, hey, Abel, I really like the way you did this. Cain gets mad. Now, Cain brought the fruit of the land. So what we understand is he didn't bring the first nor did he bring the best. He probably plucked some vegetables, threw them in a basket, and stuck them before the Lord. And the Lord walked by and went, yeah, I ain't eating that. Those aren't even, they're not even fully ripe. I don't want that. You wouldn't eat that, would you? You're giving me this, you're giving me what you don't want, what you can afford to live without. Does that sound like today? Abel, yeah, absolutely I like that because you know what? You gave me your first. And it was your best. And there's no guarantee that I will do anything with that. This is a gamble for you. This is a risk for you. You are going to need me to come through for you. And I will. So what does Cain do? Blue in the face. So God shows up. And he, he's going to have a conversation with him. And he goes, okay, you know, I, I, don't, I don't, you know, why are you angry? That's a natural question, right? You ever see your kid get like, you know, throw himself on the floor? So what are you so mad about? <laughs> you know, and, and they, whatever, they him and they haw and they yell and they, 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 they fuss and whatever. So why is your face so downcast? What are you all depressed about, man? This is, I mean, let's be honest. Ain't a whole lot to be depressed. There's only four people in the world right now. He goes, if you do what is right. How many have this conversation with kids? If you do what is right, 
Will it not be accepted? Things are going to go well for you if you do what's right. But if you don't do what's right, sin is crouching at your door and it desires to have you, but you must rule over it. You've got a decision to make right now how you want to worship, how you want to give, how you want to live, how you want your faith to engage. Whether you want it to, to be a demonstration or if you just want to step back and have a cultural faith is what he's saying. Is your faith just going to be defined by the culture itself? And you know what? We should do this. And so I'm just going to kind of grab a couple things, throw it. And you know what? I hope, you know, God, that, that's, that should be good enough. That's, that, that, it's costing me something. So go ahead and take it. Or is it going to be something else? So Cain decides, you know what? This is probably worth having a discussion about. So he goes over and he finds his brother and he goes, hey, let's go for a walk. So I, I just want to talk to you about the offering thing. And, you know, how did you come about? And all of a sudden he grabs a rock and pow! Out goes Abel. Out goes Abel. Kills him. Why? Because when you lean right as opposed to left, left does not naturally like right-leaning people. And so jealousy, envy, rage, and murder crop up. And guess what he does at that one time? He eliminates 25% of the world's population. The writer of Hebrews goes, let me, this, this is what makes this guy such a, a, a wonderful plaque, you know, and there's Abel. Not with a caved head, but, you know, all well kind of, you know, and, and he's, he's saying, look, look at this guy, man. This guy, this guy didn't even, it's the beginning of time. He had all kind of choices to make. He could have chose this, but he chose this. He chose to worship God. He didn't choose this. He didn't choose what was easy. He chose faith. He chose trust. He chose this. This is what makes him the very first one that we're going to talk about. That's the kind of faith. It's in motion. It's a demonstration. It's not just sitting there going, yeah, I believe this. Yeah, I believe this. Yeah, I believe this. Yeah, I believe this. And then I stand alone. I don't do anything. He put it into motion. He is that kind of a guy. He was the guy who lived in the world but was not of the world. He knew he was being born into another world. That there was another way. So faith then, as we said, back to, you can put your finger here and kind of go back to, to Hebrews. Faith then is understanding, isn't it? Which is our next point. It involves understanding and understanding leads us to our total commitment. There has to be some kind of conviction that gives us and brings us to this, this we're all in. This is why we do what we do. This is why we live the way we live. This is why we believe the way we believe. This is why. It answers all of the how-tos and why-ofs that we, we have when we are living our life as believers. Because biblical faith is not just knowing the facts. The facts, yes, they're important, but they're not the bottom line. The bottom line is, what do I do with those facts? Understanding is facts in motion. It means I do what they say. I follow Jesus, as we said, week after week by actually following and doing what he says. So I have to commit my life to Jesus Christ. And then there is a conviction to model that life to others. That's the ouch part of Christianity. I think that's the hardest part of Christianity is you've got to model this. To know that everything about our life causes us to do and, and motivates us to do what we do. And it's a, it's a response because when I understand this thing called love, like biblical love, 
When I understand what John says, that we didn't love God first. God loved us first and gave himself for us so that we could have life and therefore love one another. That loving one another really only really works when I get this. So if I don't really dig deep and dive deep into the, the, the concept and quality of God's love, of loving us first, because most of us, we look in the mirror and go, uh, I don't really know. And brokenness kind of damages all of that. As, as Jesus comes to restore humanity to being fully human, the first and natural inclination is to take us back to here, that we understand how God loves us. So then we can fulfill what Jesus tells us to do, to love then God in response with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of mind, and all of our strength. And then we commit with conviction to love others. Apart from this, we don't convict, that we're not convicted or I should say that, I'm saying it backwards. We're not committed with conviction to love others. We just kind of do. You know, and most people, the conversation is, I don't really like people. And, you know, people kind of annoy me. Well, they're supposed to annoy you. <laughs> it's the purpose, guys. The whole purpose is people should annoy you. You should have annoying neighbors. You should have people that annoy you in the seat. The music probably should annoy you. The way that, that, we, that we preach should probably annoy you. The way we do things should probably annoy you. Your spouse probably should annoy you. Otherwise, love is easy. It's not easy. It means I give my first and my best to you when I don't want to give you my first and best. But I only get that when I give God my first and my best. And he says Abel's the first one to do that. He's the first one to do that. So look at the, look at the bust, read the plaque, and then take that from your life. And from Abel, it's the first. It's the best which causes them, causes us to ask, is that defined me? It's what helps us in the, this concept called changed life of Christianity. Now, last thing he teaches is this. Because I read the story and go, a Abel does the right thing and he gets gypped. Yes, I mean, got his head caved in. And we're not really, he could have been choked to death. I don't, I don't know how... I'm just assuming a rock to the head seems like. By the way, whole nother thing, how did he come up with the idea? No one had died to that point. I mean, all of a sudden, then you know how the, the world and the, all the decisions and leaning left kind of all, all snowball. But here's the point. Faith is not always rewarded in this lifetime. He gets killed as a result of his faith. So it kind of give you a sense why I think the writer picked him first, right? So it's not always rewarded, guys. You're feeling like this is a ripoff and a jip, that life, that your faith isn't rewarding you? Let's go back to the greats. Let's start with the first one. Think he was rewarded? No, it's not always rewarded in this lifetime. And anybody that tells you it is, is probably lying to you or trying to extract something from you. It's not. See, the concept here in our life is this. Maybe this life isn't so much about a final score. Maybe it's not about winning. You know, I used to say all the time, we're not even unless I'm ahead. Right? I had an older brother who used to beat the snot out of me, and I would retaliate. But then I would retaliate again because I don't, the first one just got me even. The second one puts me back ahead. I got to be ahead. Right? There's a competitiveness to humanity. We want to be ahead. We're not always. This isn't about the score who wins. There isn't a scorecard. Second guy is going to teach us something. And the second guy, go back, go back to Hebrews. This is kind of a cool guy. Um, not a whole lot written about this guy. Um, and it's a guy by the name of 
Enoch. He says in verse 5, by Enoch, or by faith, Enoch was taken from this life, which is an interesting thing, that by faith he was taken. Doesn't mean that it was his faith that caused him to be taken, it was his faith that caused him to be taken. Just the, the order of the words in the Greek don't match per perfectly here. So that he, did not exper he didn't experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For be before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and he's a rewarder and rewards those who earnestly seek him. So we like to claim and quote that part. We don't like to claim the part and quote the part it was by his entire life of faith that he pleased God. So this is written after the fact of, of Enoch. So it literally means this. The translation would go like this. Enoch, as a guy, made God happy. And that's all he did. He made him so happy that God looked at him and said, you know what? The worst thing that life can throw at you is death. I like you so much. I'm just going to, we're just going to bypass this. And that's Enoch's life. He lives 300 years. 65 years, he begins to walk with God. At the end of 65 years, he's no more. Now, people are living 969 years. This guy was like, he died so young. We don't even know where he went. Don't know what happened to him. I mean, what a shame. Oh, my gosh. You know, he was barely a man. He's 365 years old. He's barely a man. Because God took him. He walks with God, and he makes God happy. Picture of Enoch. Kind of the glow around him with like a smiley face. The upside down, you know, rainbow. God's smiling over this guy. He made me so happy, I took him. The question is, how do you make God happy like that? Is it by, yes, I accept Jesus as my Savior. Now I'm going to leave. What did he do? Which brings us to the next point. Faith is the only way that we please God. It's the only way we please God. See, this life is a resume for the next life. It's all this is. It's our resume for the next life. The things that we do. If you notice, there's nothing bad in any of these guys. And all these guys, they weren't perfect. It's, it's the, the high points, the faith points, the trusting points, the willingness to, to surrender, the willingness to care, be compassionate, be forgiving, um, serving, giving, being generous. All of that is, is what makes up the resume. And just in a couple verses, we're told, you know, that this guy was that kind of a guy. That's all, that's all we know. And, and so the walk of life that's a pleasing life brings us to the next point, which is very simply, faith is the reason we live leaning toward God's kingdom and not towards this world. And that's how pleasing looks to God when we lean right, not left. If you're a Democrat in the room, this has nothing to do with Democrat, Republican. He pleases, next guy up actually does some pretty cool things. The next guy up is a right, hard right leaning guy in a crazy world. And probably for anybody that wants to go, okay, how do you navigate a world that's this crazy, this corrupt, this evil? Noah becomes the study, the case study for this. And he's next man up. He's our third and final guy. Verse 7 says, By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, okay, 
what's not yet seen? Well, the world's going to end. I'm going to flood it. He doesn't know what that means. Rain didn't exist yet. In holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. And so what does he do? Well, you've got to kind of get his story, so we've got to go back to Genesis. and We'll read a little bit about Noah and his ark. And we find a little bit uh, in chapter 6 of Genesis, and beginning in verse 9, it says this. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. So he's kind of maybe playing off of, you know, Enoch and saying, you know, I'm, I'm going to make him happy and I'm, I'm trusting him and, and I'm communing with him. I'm playing off Abel and I'm worshiping him the way he prescribes, not the way I want to. All's going well. In the middle of this, verse 11, now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and it was full of violence. Verse 12, God saw how corrupt the earth had become for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God says to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people for this earth is filled with violence because of them. I'm surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood, make rooms in it, coat it with pitch inside and out. And this is how you're to build it. And you're to build it like really big. It's going to be 450 feet long. It's going to be 70 feet wide, 75 feet wide. It's going to have three stories to it. It's going to be massive, 450 feet, football field and a half long, 75 feet wide, half a football field wide, three stories high. I mean, this thing's massive. Noah is 500 years old when this is told to him, all right? It takes him 100 years to build it. He's 600 when he climbs in the ark. 100 years. Now, it, when, you, when you go to, like, children's church and, and, and preschool, they're, you're always told that Noah was ridiculed by the people, and they all made fun of him, and they came out and go, what are you building, building an ark? Oh, that's so stupid. What's an ark? You know, and they kept making fun of him. They were really not told he was ridiculed at all. That's the one thing that we're not told that happened. All we know is that Noah faithfully keeps building. And he... He is obeying God how? He's obeying him by faith. He believes what? He has a confident hope, and somehow he has an evidence of what he can't see. He has no idea what's over here. He has no idea what I'm going to destroy the earth really looks like. He has no idea other than I'm supposed to build this ark. And so he is obeying God. And the way he's obeying God, it says, is he's living differently than a corrupt and evil world. So what is he living? He's living uncorrupted. He's another guy that's living in the world, but not of the world. He's leaning right, not left. He's not making decisions based on the culture. He's not making decisions that are based on the natural man, the intuition of man. He's not basing decisions that are immediately gratified. How many people know building something for 100 years, your gratification is going to be delayed for a little bit? All right? He's not doing this because I'm going to show the world what kind of potential I am as a boat builder, and I'm going to have a new business, and I'm going to crank out arcs because I'm going to live another 300 years, so I can at least build three more of these. No, he's over here going, you know, this appears to be my purpose. And so by faith, I'm following, I'm obeying. I'm living uncorrupted, and I'm living opposite of evil, or I'm living God's way in this world, not the world's way, because I believe this is my purpose. And then we know the story, how it begins to unfold. He's committed to following him no matter what. They finally get in the ark and everything cuts loose and life changes. But for us, you take that and you go, faith is living differently than our culture. It's, it's, it's living differently in all the areas of our life. It's why our finances, it's why our marriages, our singleness, our work life, our language, how we speak to one another, our relationships, how we relate to one another, our forgiveness, how we forgive one another. It's why they don't make sense to the culture. On 
Thursday, I was working out at the Y at lunchtime, and I have three screens in front of me, TVs that I can look at and read as I'm, as I'm running, which makes the running seem less painful. Um, and I got Sports Center on one side, the price was right on one side, which I kind of vacillate between. I, I like to see if I can win this and guess the right thing, and then I also like to catch up on what's going on. But in the middle is the show that I really, I, I'm not even gonna tell you my opinion of it, but it's a show that has a lot of ladies on it, and they have a certain view, so you can figure out what it's called. <laughs> and they're talking about this lady that went in and shot a cop. And they're showing the, the, the thing of the, uh, the guy's brother. And he goes up and asks if he can give her a hug and says, I forgive you. And then the judge comes down and, and gives the woman a Bible. And, and something that I never heard, I never thought I would hear come out of some of these people, Whoopi Goldberg, you know, and the thing that's underlined says, now that right there is a Christian. And that's what we're looking to see in this world because I don't see that in people that claim to be Christians. Now, the other side went at this guy hard, saying without peace or without justice, we can have no peace, and, and this person needs to be, you know, basically, you know, thrown in prison and, and, and for life or killed or whatever. And, and so what you find is when we live differently, you never know the impact it has. And I don't know the impact that this will have on her. All I know that I, I never thought from from this particular individual that that's how she would view Christianity. <laughs> to say, now that is a Christian. Phenomenal that we see that kind of thing. See, our, our faith can't stop at being intellectual. It can't just stop. It has to move way beyond that. It has to become action. It has to become a demonstration. It's why we do what we do at C3. It's why we do what we do, so that there is nothing in this area that can hinder a person from coming to Jesus. You know, I tell our staff every week, man, Sunday is game day. We do all what we do all week long for this moment. Our, oh, we're going to be talking to our, our volunteers that, look, the reason that you're at the door is to make it great for people to come to find Jesus. The reason we give coffee and the reason we do breakfast is to bring people to Jesus. The reason that we have a nursery, the reason that we watch people's kids when we don't really like watching kids, the reason we teach kids, the reason we do light the night, the reason we do uh, city mission, the reason we do whatever we do, that reason has to be to bring people to Jesus. Otherwise, we don't do it. And we don't do a lot. We are just trying to be as focused as we can, that people see a demonstration of a group of people's faith that enables them to come and find Jesus without being told this is what you need to do and you're going to hell if you don't. We don't know all what goes on, nor do we have the right to tell people where they end up or where they're going or where they're not going based on what facts they have. What we they need to see is I want in on what you do. Noah didn't do anything. Noah left that door open for a hundred years and said, you want to follow? Come on in. Zero people took him up on it. But when the door was closed, there was no longer any opportunity, no matter how loud you cried, no matter how hard you knocked. And so we keep the doors open. We keep this place open. When we welcome people, we welcome people not to be weird, but just to say, you got a place here. we got all these seats right here that are open that can be filled with somebody who needs to come and find Jesus and learn a little bit more about faith and a little bit more how you live life God's way so that they can lean right, so that life can be a little bit better, so that this can expand a little bit in our area. They don't need weird stuff. They don't need freaky stuff. They don't need weird people, awkward people, goofy people. They need real real people with real faith in a real God that says, you know what? We have confidence in the future. It's okay. And you know what? Our world might be corrupt. Our world might be evil right now. But you know what? It's pretty good over here. All this is is a little taste of how great it's going to be because when we get there, there's not going to be any of this. There's not going to be any corruption. There's not going to be any sadness. There's not going to be any disease. You're not going to have to worry about anything. All you're going to have to worry about doing is you've already leaned so far right 
and following what God would have you do, that your resume is full, you fit, you walk right in. You walk right in and go, man, this is just like how I was living. It's why another group of people couldn't come in because they'd hate it. They would hate it. In the mercy of God, I'm telling you right now that the people that cannot stand life that way and forgiveness that way and generosity that way and relationships that way and singleness that way and parenting that way and marriage that way would hate God's kingdom. Would hate it. Because that's not how they live because they live so far left. They've leaned so far left that that is nonsense. And I want nothing to do with it. And how many people have ever had that kind of a discussion with a person? And you go, all we can do is bring you in. You still have a place. I'm telling you, I could care less. If this whole section was filled with atheists and, and whatever other group of people that would blow our mind away, come on in. Come on in. Let's have a discussion. Why don't you believe? I'm not afraid of the fact that they might believe and that they have facts. I have facts too. Guys, we're not morons. We're not idiots. We are not weak-minded people who have a crutch called faith that we lean on and go, oh, we're just weird people that God is going to get all of you rotten people who have abused us. That's not what this is about. This is about a king with a kingdom, with a great kingdom and a wonderful place that's going to take care of everything, who's going to answer every question you had, and he gives us glimpses in chapter 11 of guys who bought in who not only changed their life, but changed their culture, who did not believe like their culture. Cultural faith does nothing. Cultural faith does not bring people to Christ. Cultural faith pushes people away from Christ. I'm not interested in cultural faith. I'm interested in demonstration of faith, in faith in action, in how we embrace and love what's unlovely. So our application, it involves just a couple things, general statements. Number one, you've got to ask yourself, so is my faith intellectual or is it biblical? First thing, biblical faith involves us submitting to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That means we follow Jesus by actually following Jesus. We do what he says, no matter what that looks like. We give because he says. We're generous because he calls us to be generous. We work on how we live in this culture. We deal with our singleness. We deal with our marriage. We deal with our parenting. We deal with our workplace, how we work, when we work, all of that because of what he says. We don't just sit there and go, I don't like this job. This job stinks, and so I'm going to go do something. No, that's not what he says. We live. We give. We, we vote all of that in a way that he says. So, so we submit. Secondly, that kind of faith changes then our lifestyle. It creates us to be right-leaning people, doesn't it? Changes how we think, how we act, and how we react to people. Changes everything about how we love, how we serve, how we give, how we do community, how we sacrifice. Changes how, how we do church, what we do, and how we do it. See, it, it changes our total motivation for the why we do what we do, or what we do, or how we do what we believe. It's our motivation, right? And so these guys begin to show us what biblical faith is. Evidence that we can't see. Confident hope. And if guys way, way, way back then, the writer would say to the, to the Jewish believer, if they could do it, so can you. And today, if the people back in the first century could do it, so can we. We can live uncorrupted in a very corrupted way. We can be a community and together in a world that values separateness and aloneness. We have a standalone faith. God is one. 
Jesus died on the cross, rose again, ascended into heaven, will come again to judge the living and the dead. We have a standalone faith. We just do not stand alone in that faith. And that's the difference, and that's what they show us. Amen? Let's stand. So our personal faith keeps us moving each day, looking for opportunities. How do we help? How do we show compassion? How do we engage? Abel shows us how we worship God's way, not ours. Enoch shows how we walk in a way to please God, to put a smile on his face. Noah shows us how to live uncorrupted in a corrupted world. Next week we'll see Abraham and Moses and we'll just continue on our way, taking a little snapshot from each of these guys so that the collective aspect of this gives us the definition of what personal faith and what faith really is, the evidence of what we cannot see, the things that we can be confident in about the future. So Father, this morning we just thank you again for our day today. And Lord, we all have areas in our life that need to be brought before you. Maybe some attitudes, some things, so that our faith can be a demonstration. It can be set in motion. It's an action. It's pleasing to you. It's following you, making you Lord over us, not us over us. And so in any of those areas, before we go, Lord, I just ask that by your spirit, you would just point that out so we can just lay that at the altar before we go. And that, Lord, that you can continue to refresh us with your spirit. Because in this room resides people who are Abel-like, who are Enoch-like, who are Noah-like. People that do some incredible things as a result of their faith in you. And Lord, if there's those that may not have begun that journey, then we pray that they would begin today, that they would choose to invite you into their life, that they would lay down that sin and say, Lord, I just, I just give that to you. I confess that to you and I invite you to come into my life to begin this journey so that I can be Abel-like, Enoch-like, Noah-like. And Father, as we go and dismiss this morning, once again, we do so under your blessing. So I'm praying today that you'll bless us again, that you'll cause your face to, to, to shine brightly upon us, that you'll keep us very safe throughout this week, that the very countenance of you will surround us, that your spirit will fill us fresh, and that, Lord, we'll walk out of here today a little different than we came in, and that we can begin a journey of this week of just bringing light into dark places, good news into bad news places so that people can know who you are and maybe have an opportunity to begin their journey of faith. So, Father, we thank you for that. We ask all of this in Jesus' name.